Hello, this is my spoiler review slash breakdown slash Easter eggs. It's a lot in one. I made my spoiler free review last week, but I held back on a lot, so I'm gonna dig really deep for this video. I'm gonna do an in-depth review and breakdown, talking about things I liked, things I didn't like, notable moments, and I'll finish it off with some Easter eggs that I found. So without further ado, let's get into it. As I said in my last review, I liked it. I think it's much better than The Crimes of Grindelwald, and I think it's about equal to the first Fantastic Beast film, which I think is high praise, because I like that movie a lot. As I said in my last review, I was expecting much more patching up to fix mistakes from the last movie, much like the Star Wars sequel trilogy had to do, but surprisingly, there were not that many examples of this. It was able to be its own story free of the baggage from the previous film, which I think is a major accomplishment. The last movie had major problems with the writing. Even I can say that, and I made a whole video defending the crimes of Grindelwald. It was written more like a novel than a screenplay, which I think really hurt the final product. For example, Lally, a main character in this movie, was in the last movie. But if you didn't read the screenplay, you have no idea who she was. The script said that she was Eulali Hicks, a professor at Ilvermorny, but that was lost in translation. Steve Clovis, who wrote the screenplay for 7 out of the 8 original Harry Potter movies, came on board to help Rowling with this film, and I think that was a very good thing. The film was not plagued with the same confusing writing style that led to many flaws in the last movie. As I said in my last review, Newt had limited screen time. He sort of took the back seat to Grindelwald and Dumbledore, which I don't mind too much because I find Albus and Gellert's relationship very intriguing, but at the same time, I can understand why people are upset about this. Newt is the main character of the series. That being said though, though Newt had limited scenes, I think every scene he was a part of in this movie was spectacular. And I said that in my last review, but I couldn't give examples because it was a spoiler free review, so I'm going to give examples and break it down for you as to why. This movie took his character much further emotionally, more than we had ever seen before. In his first scene, we see Newt witness the murder of a beast he was trying to save, and seeing him next to it and apologizing to it as it died was tragic. I have other things to say about this scene that aren't praise, but I'll get to that later. Another scene that showed more of Newt was him giving up his suitcase to Bunty. You can see the conflict in his face, but he knows handing it over is what he has to do, and I think it shows how much he's grown over the course of these films. I do not think he would have handed it over in the first movie, and maybe not even in the last movie. Newt and Theseus' relationship is also worth mentioning. Let's be honest, they've never been close. That's your brother? So I think I may have mentioned in my letters that we have quite a complicated relationship. Newt, stop! Does he want to kill you? Frequently. There's one scene in this movie where Newt introduced everybody to Lally except Theseus, which highly offended Theseus. What really fascinated me, though, was the parallel between Newt and Theseus and Albus and Aberforth. When it's mentioned that Albus has a brother, the Scamander brothers have this moment where they uncomfortably look at each other. Both sets of brothers start out bitter to their sibling, but by the end of the movie, they're both on much better terms. It's cool to see how these brotherly relationships parallel and balance off each other. It sort of reminds me of two relationships in the Half-Blood Prince, and I'm of course talking about Tonks and Lupin and Bill and Fleur. Without a push from one relationship, the other relationship would not succeed moving forward. This movie actually excelled at matching characters up. Past the two sets of brothers, I love the pairing of Credence and Queenie, both of whom finished the last movie with the same arc. They left the person they had a close relationship with to join Grindelwald. The scenes they had together were very significant, especially when Credence asked Queenie to read his mind. That was very fascinating. I also love the chemistry between Jacob and Lally. They hit some of the funniest lines in the movie, like when they talked about the Norwegian Minister of Magic looking like Jacob's uncle. And speaking of Jacob, I think he had the best character arc in this whole movie. And I said that in my last video, which a lot of you questioned me on, so now that I can give spoilers, I'm going to break it down and explain why I think that. Jacob starts out as a man who was shunned the Wizarding World after what happened in the last movie when he got his heart broken. When he talks to Lally, he says he's like the pan he's holding. He's dented and beaten up. Then he ends up bringing the pan on the train, and while on board, he replaces this pan, which represents his broken muggle life with a magical wand, taking his first step of healing and finally accepting the Wizarding World back into his life. We see Jacob go through some real trials, even getting the torture curse used on him by Grindelwald, but through it all, he's resilient. He remembers what Dumbledore and Lally said to him, saying that he's more than just an ordinary man, which is actually a callback to his character arc in the first film. I ain't never gonna find anyone like you. This load's like me. No. No. There's only one like you. 
Jacob's arc with Queenie is also fascinating and is another character matchup that I think is very significant. In his first scene, Jacob's making a wedding cake and the statue of the man falls down. This statue parallels his own arc. At this point in time, he's sort of fallen into a hole just like the statue of the groom that fell. But at the end of the film, we again see him in front of a wedding cake, but this time the groom is standing proud and tall next to his wife, which again parallels Jacob at the end of the movie. He's gained a ton of confidence and the woman he loves is back by his side again. As I said in my spoiler review, one of my favorite parts about this movie was the beasts. Specifically how important the beasts were to this plot. The series is called Fantastic Beasts, but they were greatly lacking in the last film, which was disappointing. They had a lot of beasts, but they were not essential to the plot like in this film or the first film. A few scenes with the beasts were pretty dark. Just 15 minutes into the film, we saw two beasts be killed right in front of us. Then we have the manticore scene where we see a body be pulled down, ripped apart and disfigured, thrown back up, and see its remains be eaten by the little manticores. That's some dark stuff. The Wyver was a cool addition to the list of magical beasts in the Wizarding World as well. I absolutely loved the rescue scene it was involved in. But the creature that this film depends on, and the creature that made me so happy to see, was the Chillin. Without this creature, the movie would not be, and I think that was a great bit of writing on their part. They listened to the fans and made the necessary changes. This creature is the end-all be-all to the plot. Without it, the story would not work. The effects in this film were incredible. It was one of the best parts of the movie. The dinner party scene was executed to perfection. They really went all out and have come a long way since similar CGI effects in The Half-Blood Prince. I also love the fight scene with Lally and Theseus. They had some clever choreography and effects that we hadn't really seen before. As I said in my last review, because they aren't taking this story from the page, they're free to move past just two wizards pointing wands at one another. That worked well for the novel, which the films were of course stuck with being an adaptation of the book. But being an on-screen medium allows the Fantastic Beast films much more freedom, and I think that the three fights in this movie all crack the top five in the Wizarding World. I think they did a really good job bringing Tina's character into the story, especially considering how little time Catherine Watterson was available to shoot. They took advantage of every moment they had with her, and her character brought nothing but positivity to the film, the characters, and especially the nude. I love their awkward yet endearing moment at the end of the movie, it's just so them. Now I've spent this whole time praising this movie explaining what I liked, but now it's time to talk about what I didn't like and give some criticism. As I said in my last review, the film constantly broke the established rules that have been set up in the Wizarding World for such a long time. And now that I'm doing a spoiler review, I can actually give examples. One example of this, which is more minor, is that no one says the spells they're shooting out loud. The only time they did was when Grindelwald used the Cruciatus Curse, but then seconds later, he doesn't say anything when shooting the Killing Curse. We saw several Petrificus Totalis spells shot, which they said out loud in the first movie. Petrificus Totalis. So why didn't they say it out loud here in this movie? I know there are non-verbal spells, but they're very hard to do. It's like choosing to run when you can walk. You only do non-verbal spells when you have to, and you pretty much always have to say the spell out loud for the unforgivable curses. Even the best witches and wizards like Moody, who's arguably the best aura of all time. <laughs> and speaking of the unforgivable curses, let's talk about the killing curse in this movie. First of all, we saw the Chillin be hit by the Killing Curse, which should have killed it right away, but it takes like 15 to 10 minutes to die. That's just not how it works whatsoever. When hit by the curse, you die instantly, so why are they changing these rules? The Killing Curse is also supposed to be unblockable. Moody literally said this in the fourth book, but Albus and Aberforth blocked Grindelwald's Killing Curse when he tried to kill Credence. There are some loopholes, of course. It can be blocked if the wand it's going against shares the same core, like Harry and Voldemort's did, or if you sacrifice your life to save somebody else like Lily did for Harry. But neither of those things are a factor here. Their wands did not share the same core, and no one died to protect Credence, so they shouldn't have been able to block it. Another rule they broke was an established Quidditch rule. Rowling told us that the Golden Snitch is bewitched to stay in the boundaries of the field, but here we see the Snitch outside of the boundaries. It's part of an easter egg that was sort of pointless if you ask me, and it sort of reminds me of the McGonagall blunder in the last movie. They're trying to please fans by adding a Quidditch scene or bringing back a character, but neither needed to be there and both of them caused some flaws in the movie. 
Looking at Lowley's book, that also contradicts some Harry Potter lore. They say it's a port key. I can't pass up a good port key. But it doesn't act as a normal port key, which can only be used once, because they use it multiple times. Maybe Jacob was just being a muggle and mistook it for a port key, and it might actually be a new magical item added to the Wizarding World. If that's the case though, that's stupid for two reasons. One, why doesn't she just apparate? It does the same thing, and it's probably way faster to just wave your wand than to be sucked into a book. And two, why did it make Lally and Jacob come out of the fireplace? That's a completely different form of traveling called flu powder. Did this book transport them into the flu network? The flu network alone makes people sick as you fly past chimney after chimney, so adding being sucked into a book beforehand seems weird. All of this sort of ruins the different forms of traveling in the Wizarding World for me. I guess the trio did apparate through a fireplace in the Deathly Hallows film, which in itself always bothered me. In the book, they went through the fireplace, came out of the toilet, and then disapparated. But it begs the question, are the Fantastic Beasts films based on the book's canon like Rowling said, or are they basing it on the film's canon, which is very different from the books? I feel like these are pretty simple questions a writer should ask themselves, especially when the story takes place in such a vast universe. If you ask me, Rowling really dropped the ball here. Another rule broken was Jacob coming into Hogwarts. There are meant to be charms to make it impossible for muggles to see the castle. All they would see were ruins and several warning signs. In the last movie, we saw all of the heroes apparate on the bridge of Hogwarts, which included Jacob, but I gave them the benefit of the doubt and assumed this was outside of the Hogwarts grounds. Because one, you cannot apparate or disapparate inside of the castle's grounds, and two, muggles can't see the castle. So again, I assumed they were outside of the grounds, which allowed them to apparate, and I assumed Jacob just saw the ruins. But I guess I gave Rowling too much credit, because as we see in this movie, Jacob could see, enter, and physically be in Hogwarts, which breaks so many rules that the original series established. I also greatly dislike the fact that the chillin' bow to Dumbledore, meaning he is true of heart, because he himself has stated several times that he is not. This shows a major lack of understanding for Dumbledore's character arc in the original series, because the whole point of the seventh book was revealing that Dumbledore was not the saint he's made out to be. If you ask me, I think the chillin' should have chosen Newt, because he is the main character of the series, and it would have made his role in the film much larger. Dumbledore even praised Newt for being better than him in the last movie. Do you know why I admire you, Newt? More perhaps than any man I know. You do not seek power. You simply ask, is a thing right? So this would have been perfect. I think this was a wasted opportunity that would have made this movie and the series much better. And just one more small complaint that's kind of dumb, it's more of a nitpick than anything else. But we see Bunty bring Newt's suitcase to a shop so they could make some identical copies of it. But why didn't they just use magic to duplicate it? We've seen it's very possible to do such a thing. Why waste Bunty's time to wait for a muggle to do this? They even say it will take the muggle two days to do this, when it could have taken the wizards two seconds. But now, let's talk about what this movie brought to the wizarding world that's new. I already mentioned Lally's book, but moving past that, we learn about Sight of the Future, which allows one to see into the future. A gift we saw Grindelwald possess in the last movie when predicting World War II, and several times in this movie. We also learn about Countersight, which messes with and confuses the Sight of the Future, and was the whole point of the heroes splitting up in this movie. I think this is a very interesting addition to this magical world, and I hope to see more of it moving forward. We can also check off another magical government that we've seen, as we were introduced to the Ministry of Magic in Berlin. On top of that, we also got to see the Kingdom of Bhutan, which is located in the Himalayas. They explain that some of the most important magic had its origins here, and that while there, the past can whisper to you. However, I was disappointed that we never saw any part of this while there. It was just a simple temple, and instead, the blood pack turned out to be the most fascinating thing there, not the temple itself. We also have this new and very interesting magic technique that Dumbledore used on Credence. He had this tiny silver ball travel onto Credence's head, and it took them into this alternate dimension where Dumbledore was in control. He tells Credence that things here aren't quite what they appear. Things are not quite what they appear. I'm interested to read the screenplay for this part, which does not come out until July, but I think it would be interesting to see how Rowling meant for this to come across. As I said, I think they did a good job making the writing for this film adapt to the big screen, but this scene is the exception of that. This one is pretty confusing if you ask me, and it's one of the coolest scenes visually, but it's one of the worst scenes for the story because it's just not clear how or why this is happening. I thought we would at least get some dialogue to explain what exactly took place in the scene, but we never did. From what I gather, this is an alternate reality which Dumbledore put them in to protect the civilians around them, but for some reason, the Phoenix wasn't protected from it because it too was in this alternate dimension, so I don't know how that works. 
Also, if I'm right, and that's what's happening, this would have been useful several times in the original series, like when he fought Voldemort in the Ministry, constantly worrying about Harry's safety, or even on the Astronomy Tower. Adding something like this to a prequel makes a lot of plot holes, so if you ask me, this should have been left on the cutting room floor. Another new aspect of the series is finding out that the summer Albus fell in love with Grindelwald, his brother Aberforth fell in love as well, and actually had a child who is Credence. So we finally find out who Credence is, and after waiting 4 years to learn this, I'm happy with the result. I think it's a very fitting end to his character arc. This film also answers two questions that we had, one from each of the previous two films. First, they finally say out loud that Ariana was an Obscurial, which was implied in the first film but never fully confirmed. And second, we finally hear Dumbledore say that he loved Grindelwald, which again had been implied but was never actually said so blatantly. While editing, I also thought of one more thing. We finally learn the name of the Niffler, Teddy, which I feel like we should have known long before this, but I'm glad he has a name now. And it's now time to do my favorite part of the video, go over all of the easter eggs that I spotted. In the opening scene, we see Dumbledore and Grindelwald discuss the summer they spent together, which we learned all about in the Deathly Hallows, as they made plans to rule over Mugglekind. Queenie mentions Credence being the Dumbledore's family dirty little secret. A similar line was used by Rita Skeeter in the Deathly Hallows about Ariana Dumbledore, as she explained how the Dumbledore family hid her existence and locked her away in the house. We see the location of Hogsmeade, the town next to Hogwarts, and they go into the Hog's Head, which is where the first DA meeting took place in the fifth book. On the train, Lally says that all of her fifth year students at Ilvermorny read Newt's book, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which by Harry's time, every school has their students doing, even in the first year. The portkey tie given to Theseus is one from Ilvermorny, and it depicts the Thunderbird House logo, one of the four houses at the American Wizarding School. On the train, Jacob takes a shot of giggle water, which he did for the first time at the bar in the first film. We see the Dumbledore brothers talk about their sister Ariana, and how themselves nor their mother could control her, all of which was taken right from the pages of the Deathly Hallows book. When they reach the Ministry in Berlin, there's a moving banner of the Minister, just like Fudge had in the British Ministry of Magic during the original series. The message Dumbledore had Newt deliver to Anton Vogel was, Do what is right, not what is easy, which is a callback to his line in the Goblet of Fire. Soon we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy. Vogel's response to this was saying that Dumbledore never left Hogwarts and let the war outside rage on. This is referring to Dumbledore putting off his duel with Grindelwald for so long. In the original series, we found out that many were angry with Albus because he didn't stop Grindelwald's rampage until 1945, which was 10 to 15 years after he started, and clearly, the frustration with Dumbledore is starting to fester during the events of this movie. When Vogel got up to the podium, he announced that the crimes of Grindelwald had been dropped, a reference to the last movie's title. Dumbledore's glove leading Newt and the others to him is a callback to Dumbledore's first appearance in the Fantastic Beasts series where he did the same thing to Newt. The heroes using identical decoy suitcases is just like when the Order used seven decoy Harrys in the Deathly Hallows. Grindelwald sending Credence to kill Dumbledore is very reminiscent of Voldemort sending Draco to kill Dumbledore, and both young men failed their mission, which did not surprise either villain. We have a scene where Dumbledore explains what happened the night his sister Ariana died, and it just so happens to be in the exact same building, in the exact same room, in front of the exact same portrait where Aberforth told the exact same story to the trio. We see the heroes enter the Room of Requirement, which was of course the home of the DA, as well as the hiding place for Voldemort's diadem horcrux, and where Draco fixed and used the vanishing cabinet. When they reach Bhutan, we see a bunch of Dury Crawls wandering around, which were beasts that we saw in the first movie, as well as in Newt's book, which Rowling published in 2001. We see Jacob hit two bad guys in the face with a suitcase, which is a callback to him doing the same thing to Newt in the first film. When one of the cases opened, a whole army of Monster Book of Monsters popped out, the same textbook Hagrid assigned his students in The Prisoner of Azkaban. During the election, we see shots of people watching in the British Ministry of Magic, as well as in the French Ministry of Magic. When the Chillin chooses Dumbledore to be the leader of the International Confederation of Wizards, he says no and backs away. This is a reference to what he told Harry in the Deathly Hallows. He never wanted a position of power, because when he was young, he proved to himself that power was his weakness and temptation. When Grindelwald tried to kill Credence, we have a three-way duel, Albus and Aberforth against Grindelwald, just like the duel they had when they were kids. And at the center of both duels, there was an obscurial child part of the Dumbledore family. Back in the day, it was Ariana, and now it's Credence. And finally, my favorite easter egg in this movie. 
When Aberforth and Credence have a father-son moment, Credence asked his father if he ever thought of them, and Aberforth replied saying, Always, a line that holds so much meaning in the Harry Potter series, as both Snape and Lily said this line in the original series, and are some of the most famous lines in the Harry Potter franchise. After all this time, always. Stay close to me. Always. Overall, I enjoyed this movie. There was much more good than there was bad. It definitely has some problems, but overall, I think it's a good addition to the Wizarding World, and I think it's a really fun watch for Harry Potter fans. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life, like my cute dog Loki, and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me, and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.